Welcome to the Colorado Real Estate Leaders Podcast, brought to you by Trailstone Insurance Group, bringing you interviews with Colorado's best real estate and mortgage professionals, empowering you to understand the current trends in the housing market so you can make the American dream your reality. Enjoy today's episode. Well, it's a great day in Colorado, and welcome to the Colorado Real Estate Leaders Podcast. Today, we have with us Marshall Moore, who is a loan officer with Spire Financial. Marshall, welcome to the program. Thank you so much for having me. Excited to be here. You're welcome. I love learning from different people and their background and perspectives. And the first question I always love to hear, which really sets the tone, is what's your story? What's your background? What got you into the mortgage industry in the first place? Because probably you weren't in second grade doing career day going, I hope one day to become. So uh, what's your what's your background? Absolutely. Yeah. You know, I think that my background is a little bit unique in this space. I have done a number of different things in my life. I actually started my career as a scientist. Um, I, my degree was in biogeochemistry. Uh, and I had a piece of advice from my undergraduate advisor where she basically said, you know, I don't want you to go right back into your PhD. I want you to go out and experience the world for one year, because if you go and get your PhD immediately, you will be in academia forever and you do great in academia. But I also think that you would enjoy being out in the real world, let's call it. Interesting. <laughs> and, um, so that that set me on a little bit of a uh, an interesting trajectory that ultimately I ended up uh, teaching AP chemistry for one year that was um, you know intriguing enough that it turned into to nine years of being a teacher. Wow. Uh, so I, basically, the thing that really hooked me was trying to make curriculum be a little bit more real world and applicable to students' lives. Um, and that pretty quickly transitioned to me saying, you know what, I'm going to take on the ultimate challenge of teaching math in a way that is real world and, and connected. Uh, so I ended up doing that for six years during my first year of teaching second semester seniors. I just had this moment of what are we doing here? Well, like, why are we trying to teach conic sections that I know if you're a nerd like me, that's a very interesting puzzle to be solved. But I know that you all will not use these again in your lives. In real and life. So, yeah. yeah, exactly. Yeah. Unless you're in a very spe specific field. If you're an engineer, um, then, of course. But, uh, you know, for the most part, this was not going to be something that my students would ever use. And so I basically at first it was a little bit of a, uh, a renegade thing where I, I changed the curriculum to be a financial literacy curriculum. And after I had run it for about a month, I, I approached the principal and told him about what I was doing and he was all on board with it. And so I ended up developing that course over the span of six years. Um, it was fantastic for me. Um, but really the big thing that happened was uh, really two things. It, it, first of all, it won an award from the Colorado Department of Education, which of course made me feel awesome. good. But the thing that it really did was it made other teachers know about what I was doing and ask, hey, can we come into it and, and do an after school session to plan our finances? Because we need help in this <laughs> regard. We don't have these conversations in our society. People are left to figure it out on their own. So I think that was the thing that really got my mind turning about how I could be in this space helping adults. And ultimately, it was the mortgage world that I found myself in. And, you know, there was a, re a big reason why I ended up in the mortgage world instead of becoming a financial advisor, which is uh, sort of twofold. First of all, for the most part, a lot of financial advisors do have minimums where, you know, you, you kind of have to have a quarter million dollars or a half a million dollars before you're going to work with a financial advisor. And I wanted to know, where am I going to work with my people, with, with teachers and with people who need the help more? I, I wasn't necessarily set on only working with high net worth individuals already. And so um, the second big piece of information was, goodness, I have been teaching this course for the last six years. Uh, my wife and I had bought our own house uh, and, you know, over the span of, I, I bought it right around when I started that, that curriculum. Over the span of those six years, obviously, we, of course, um, did very well with, with our home purchase. Um, I overall believe in the power of home ownership because it's just, we, we see too many people who are able to get out of the rent cycle, stop paying their landlord's mortgage, start building equity in their own house and let appreciation do its thing. And it changes their lives. It starts them on their wealth building journey. Um, and, you know, I saw an opportunity there for me because the mortgage world, I don't think has a stellar reputation as being advisors for helping people to grow their wealth. It's more um, transactional. So I saw, I saw an opportunity and jumped in. 
Wow. That's awesome. You intrigued me when you talked about that financial literacy in the high school. And I, I've looked at your website and you talk a lot about education and helping those those high school students and all. Can you elaborate on that a little bit more? Is that being taught on a regular basis in high school or what's happening there? You know, there are some areas where there are, are strides being made. Um, I myself, before kind of pivoting to go into the financial world directly and just be able to make a, a direct impact, I looked around for a while to figure out how can I um, help to make more schools be, you know, make this a required curriculum. Like financial literacy should be taught in every high school in America. I actually think that there should be a couple of other courses as well, including a basic course on how houses work. Everybody should sure. know that, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, but overall, um, I personally, you know, and I don't mean for this to sound like a reflection on the state of the industry or or anything like that. But for me, I got to a place where um, trying to make that sort of change felt like I was bashing my head into the brick wall of bureaucracy. And I, I sort of got to a place where I said, you know, I'm trying to change the the country, but I could redefine my view of, you know, uh, like like I think I had always wanted to change the world. I think a lot of us want to change the world, right? And I think I was redefining my view of changing the world um, or changing the country. And I was redefining it to say, you know what, I'm I'm going to change the world by helping the people right in front of me right now. I'm redefining the world to be uh, the people that I am talking to, who I am present with right now. Um, and that's been been fantastic. You know, that's certainly more so the world that I live in in the mortgage world. But you get to actually see the gains that people are making. And um, and of course, over time, you let appreciation do its work and um, and a mortgage payment remains fixed. And so, you know, several years later after folks buy a house and they're ready to do their move up or, or whatever it is, you get to really see the impacts. Whereas I found for me in the broad scale, trying to make changes on kind of a more national level, um, I still have hope that it will happen, but I think it's going to be a very long process. <laughs> Maybe more boots on the ground like what you're doing. And, yeah, uh, exactly. Yeah. 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 Change and, it from the bottom know, up. And, you know, in many respects, I see uh, that's kind of what I've made my business be revolving around at the end of the day is I, I, you know, you can probably imagine this from what I've said so far, but I really do see a lender and a real estate agent as in many respects, being the only financial professionals that people under 40, maybe 45 years old generally talk to. Of course, you know, maybe you get somebody who's self-employed and they have a CPA, or maybe you get some somebody who has a, a family financial advisor. But for the most part, you know, we are the financial professionals that talk to younger folks. And therefore, we have the greatest ability to impact the most people's lives in the future. But it does require that we do a couple of things, one of which is that we be at the top of our games in terms of our understanding of financial principles. And then secondly, it also really does require that that lenders and realtors create strong teams together. Because at the end of the day, our business is, you know, it's all about communication. And Communication is so simple and yet so challenging to execute on consistently on an everyday basis, right? So, you know, um, Marshall, it, it's apparent that you are passionate about what you do. You're enthusiastic, and that's wonderful. And let's put the teacher hat on. And I've got a question based on what you were saying here. You know, you get teachers, or in your case, you know, uh, mortgage uh, professionals that are very knowledgeable, and you've got a head full of knowledge. And here comes this client, this first time home buyer or a, or a, or a borrower, and you can't just data dump boom, everything all in one whack because it's way too much. Same as a student. You can't just dump everything about financial literacy into one session or even you know a, a week or two. It's got to be sequential and it's got to be an educational process. So talk a little bit about how you help your um, clients who are borrowers, whether they're first-time home buyers or refinance, but your, your clients understand the process and feel like that you are guiding them through so that they're understanding all along the way. Totally. Yeah, this is a great question because I am totally that person who wants to put on my nerdy math brain and just sort of (laughs) dive into data and nuances and then things like that. But at the end of the day, it's really not about that. I think really from a broader financial perspective, one of the things that I talk about with, with folks is that goodness in our financial lives, we like to think that it's all about what actions are we taking, but that at the end of the day, 
every single one of us has some form of money mindset, or one might even call it money baggage that we've inherited throughout our lives, uh, you know, whether it be from our parents or just from the, the community that surrounds us, that if we don't understand some of the ways that that's influencing our, our decisions and our perceptions, then it doesn't matter how much data we have in front of us. We as human beings, we, we can't figure all of that out. So for me, I think really the process starts with uh, an understanding of, of that and of the fact that, you know, often as human beings, we want certain results. And so in order to get those results, we change our actions. But so often we're doing the different action and we're not getting the result that we desired. And that's often because the actions are driven by our underlying beliefs or yeah. even our, our identity that's underneath that. So sometimes there, and this is absolutely what you're talking about. This is very much the sort of the deeper work that takes a little bit longer, but that for me is kind of the starting place. So the, to bring it to a more specific process, what I'm really focused on right now in that is not necessarily getting home buyers excited about buying a house. Like in some ways, that is the job of a real estate agent or a lender, right? We want to get you excited about buying a house. For me, I'm really focused on getting them clear on what goes into the process of buying a house and understanding that as well as understanding the huge benefits that come from it. So that is really striving to make their beliefs about why they're doing this be much more grounded in the reality of, you know, the numbers behind buying a house first, because then that's ultimately what gets us as, um, as home buyers to a place where our actions actually lead to the results that we're looking for rather than, you know, kind of going off course a little bit. Um, so there's a couple of things that I do for that, but I'll let you uh, digest that and, and ask questions. Well, based yeah, off thank that. you. Yeah, that's a really great uh, observation because I I wanted to really pin down the word why because you use that a couple times and I think what you just described there is so essential because when a buyer borrower knows the full picture the why they're pulled toward that they don't feel pushed to do certain things and there's things in the process of buying a home refinancing a home with paperwork and minutia that get to be overwhelming but yet if they didn't really realize where they're headed and that why and that end result in that transformation, then they could get bogged down with it. But if you lay that groundwork and that mindset in place first, then all those little teeny little things that aren't super fun, they're like, okay, well, I got to do it to get to my end result. So I think that's really great the way you clearly laid that out. Yeah, totally. Absolutely. Yeah. And, you know, again, if I can put on a little bit of just because, you know, I, I imagine this type of a show uh, it is more listened to by real estate professionals than perhaps first time home buyers. So if I put on a little bit of my nerdy hat and describe some of kind of what's happening underneath the surface here, it's the fact that, you know, there's these two economists. Well, really, they were behavioral psychologists named Danny Kahneman and Amos Tversky, who created this field of behavioral economics. And basically what they said is we as human beings, when we have too many different data points in front of us all at the same time, we don't sit there and analyze every single data point and come up with the best decision that, you know, to use their words, quote, optimizes our economic utility. It's like, no, no, we're human beings, right? Like we, we make emotions based off of decisions. And typically how we do that is we create mental shortcuts. Mm -hmm. So, you know, these mental shortcuts, they call them heuristics, but basically we'll create these mental shortcuts that if they can get us to the right answer 90% of the time, then that's great. But there are that 10% of the time, or, or maybe even larger, I don't know what that the percentage is, where those mental shortcuts actually lead us in the wrong direction systematically, like every time they lead us in that wrong direction. So because largely, when you confuse, you lose. Yeah, yes, yes, absolutely. And so for me, largely, that is um, a, a big part of it is, is really trying to, to talk about some of the complexity of the real estate industry, but bring it down to a level that people, it, it makes sense to people. So, you know, at the end of the day, a real estate transaction just simply has more layers of complexity to it than putting an item in our Google shopping cart and clicking buy. And people need help to break that down and understand it. So that's, that's a large part of my process is having those conversations.
I love it. That is spectacular. And I think that anybody can fill out a form or an app or a this or talk about, you know, all the details of the process. But when you can realize that there is, you know, like that underlying belief system in there, and you could probably with your work you've done uh, you've, in the last, you know, you've been teaching high schoolers, you can probably look at certain indicators in, in a borrower and kind of know which way to kind of guide so that they don't get confused. So I think that is spectacular. Let's just kind of uh, shift years and, and wrap up with uh, this thought process, which is um, what are you seeing in the housing market right now? What are you um, guiding your clients to do? Are you working mostly with um, buyers or first-time home buyers or investors? What does that look like? Yeah, totally. So w- what I'm seeing in the housing market and who I'm working with. So let me, let me first of all, just state, I do love working with uh, two groups in general. I love working with first time home buyers and with investors. Um, big thing on the invest uh, first time home buyers for me, it's really because I just, I love the process of education and just getting yeah. somebody really comfortable and set up for their first transaction, which is generally the biggest transaction of their entire lives. Um, Investors for me are very fun because I personally am an investor and you do get to nerd out a lot more on how do you analyze an investment property and really dive into some of the things that are important. You know, is cap rate really that important or is it kind of a, a metric that has simplified everything to one number that's easy to look at, but might not tell you about some of the nuance that you would be interested in seeing, right? So those I think are kind of my two big groups that I work quite a bit with. Um, Within those groups, I will say that I'm oftentimes just trying to bring up conversations that maybe have possibilities embedded in them that people hadn't thought about previously. So you know, with first time home buyers, one of the common scenarios that happens out there is, um, and, and I guess I'll, there's a few ways that this scenario happens, but one of them is that a first time home buyer starts looking at places before they actually contact a real estate agent or a lender. And so, as we all know, sometimes they are looking at prices that are a little bit above their price range. Um, sometimes, you know, in the industry, we call this a little bit of a joke. They have champagne taste on a beer budget. <laughs> um, but Basically, what I like to do with that process is to really help people think about it in a different way. Because as we all know, like, you know, people can get disappointed by the fact that, oh my goodness, I was looking in this particular price range and now it seems like my maximum purchase price is a little bit lower than that. But in reality, that opens up a ton of doors for people. So a lot of times, some of the conversations that we are having is talking about broader scale financial principles uh, um, and specifically the options in front of them like being able to how tack. Um, so, you know, I use that term, but specifically what I'm talking about is if somebody is specifically wanting a single family home, a first time home buyer, and it turns out that, goodness, it's just looking like it's not quite in their price range. I love to talk about the idea of, you know, what would happen if you were open to the idea of finding a townhome that you perhaps hold on to for, you know, you have a three to five year plan to be able to do a move up purchase, retain that home, start renting it out and have passive cash flow coming in. Um, So just opening up some of those ideas is is always fun with uh, with some of those first time homebuyers. Yeah, the second question. I, I was just gonna say that's a huge eye opener, and it's almost like um, that when you give them the path forward past just even that first home or options they haven't thought of. Boy, th- their um, impression of you as that guide, educator, trusted advisor just amplifies that much more. Totally. And when you run the projections, the actual numbers on you know projecting that out and putting together an actual three to five year plan for what that looks like, it really opens up people's minds to the 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 power of um, the power of housing. Um, at the end of the day, you know, we have set it up in our country to where there are simply advantages to being a homeowner and taking advantage of some of those can really, yeah, of course, just build people's wealth and and expand uh, expand them into the future that they're really hoping to to have. But oftentimes, again, we don't have those conversations in our society, so it's not something that people have in the back of their minds already. I certainly didn't have it in the back of my mind when I was a teacher and we bought our first house. Um, and goodness, I wish I could go back and and advise myself, but, uh, you know, <laughs> if we had, if we had that way back machine, that would be awesome. Yeah, yeah exactly. 
Exactly. Yeah. But I mean, in terms of the power there, just one of the things that's usually powerful is the fact that a mortgage rate, your, your, your monthly payment gets locked in when you purchase the house. It's, you know, like the, the home prices are continue appreciating rent continues to go up, but your, your home, your, your actual purchase or or, um, monthly payment, it's not going up. So, you know, five years later, uh, when you actually do that move up, the amount that you can charge in rent versus your monthly payment, that sometimes just shocks people to, to realize um, the time value of, of owning real estate. Yeah. Um, yeah. And then there was a second question there, which is kind of what we're seeing in the market right now. And, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll mention that briefly. I'm sure that everybody is talking about it in the same way. Um, but at the same time, perhaps this description might be somewhat helpful for, for folks out there. Uh, I said earlier that when we buy a house, these transactions are just more complicated than, you know, putting an item in your Google shopping cart and clicking buy. And one of the reasons that that's true is because there is this intermediary layer of pricing for the majority of home buyers out there, which is they have to use a financial instrument in order to be able to purchase the house. That financial instrument is a mortgage. Mm -hmm. And so that intermediary layer of a mortgage, if the price of that goes from, I don't know, let's say two and a half percent to seven and a half percent in six months. Then like that, that would ever happen. That <laughs> insanely more expensive, right? And yeah. so we might expect that the price of the product itself, because of that intermediary layer, you know, less people are going to want to buy it. And therefore, we might expect that the price of that product drops significantly, you know? So right now, we might expect that home prices are down 20, 30%, just like the stock market. And yet, we're not seeing that. And the question is, is why? And the the answer is pretty simple. We're all seeing it. It's it's inventory. We do not have the same number of houses um, that would support the number of people who would like to buy one right now. And that's something that you can look back at the data through the years in terms of demographics. So when we look at demographics, what we're generally doing is we're looking at the births by generation from 33 to 34 years before the moment that we're looking at. So the reason that we use that time is because that's the average age of a first time home buyer. And we're looking at the births by generation to see what might we expect in terms of household formations in 33 or 34 years as people are moving off on their own and starting to buy their own houses. And, you know, at the end of the day, what we're seeing is that 2008 really messed us up. And there were a lot of reasons for that, um, along with the fact that loans were being written that were just uh, not appropriate in terms of levels of risk, you know, sort of, um, to, to make an exaggeration here, uh, back in the day before I was even in the industry, of course, it was sort of one of those things where it's like, Oh, you know, 500 credit score and 0% down, uh, you know, sure. Let, like, let's do it. You know, <laughs> that sets up a really dangerous, uh, situation in the economy. But then on top of that, we also had this um, this decrease in household formations. And that's very evident in the data from 33 years before. But at the same time, we saw that decrease and builders didn't catch on to the data. They kept building. And, you know, we ended up in the situation where in that case, the housing bubble caused the recession, not the other way around. The recession didn't cause the housing crisis. It was the other way around. And so, you know, right now we find ourselves in a place where if people are wondering what the future of the housing market looks like, well, inventory is our big issue and we cannot build houses fast enough to um, to, to fix this issue in the next 10 years. And so, you know, home prices will remain supported despite the fact that interest rates are higher. Um, and in terms of the interest rate outlook, you know, we don't foresee them going back ever <laughs> necessarily to those two and a half or three percent interest rates that was largely brought on and helped by the Fed buying up thirty five billion dollars of mortgage backed securities every month. And so um, with that in mind, we're really looking at our strategy moving forward, knowing that it is incredibly important that we, you know, that we get our first time home buyers into houses now, really. Um, before we continue to see uh, continued appreciation and continued uh, lack of inventory. Um, so that's kind of what the basis of our long-term strategy, I suppose, is right now. That's not, of course, getting into the specifics about how investors are pricing certain interest rates and what our refinance strategy is and those well, things. But and that's, that's a, kind of the overview. 
Yeah, that's a huge point, Marshall, because no matter what the rate is today, we don't need to mention rates today because next week they might change and next month they might change. And whatever the rate environment is, it's going to be fluid and moving up and down and all around. You just need to make the best decision for you in that moment. And that's where you come in with your process and your education and your teaching spirit. And I think that's where people need to go. Wow. Thank you for helping me understand. Now I'm going to make the best decision for my family now for this investment, for this first uh, first uh, home that I'm buying. So I think that is just spectacular what you do. And I love your approach to serving your clients. And so let's just wrap up with this. If someone is listening to this going, hey, um, let me learn more about what Marshall can do for me. What's the best way they can uh, reach out and connect with you? Yeah, you know, right now, as strange as it is as it is for me to hear these words coming out of my mouth, I have really leaned into Instagram. So if they find me over mortgages with Marshall on Instagram, um, that is really the biggest platform that I'm trying to just put out very short little educational tidbits. And um, I think they'll get a lot out of that. And I encourage folks to reach out, shoot me a DM on DM on Instagram. I'm pretty responsive there. Um, and of course, if they uh, if they'd like, they can always shoot me an email or, or give me a phone call. Happy to connect. Excellent. Well, Marshall, thank you so much for coming on. It was a real pleasure talking with you today. It was a pleasure to speak with you all as well. Thank you for listening to the Colorado Real Estate Leaders Podcast, brought to you by Trailstone Insurance Group. To learn more about the topics mentioned on today's show or listen to past episodes, visit www.coloradorealestateleaders.com.